It's too bad that you can't actually see DNA easily under a microscope and scan across the double helix and read out uh, the sequence of bases that uh, amounts to the information content. Because it would be easier, I think, to explain then how a geneticist goes about tracking down the molecular basis of a disease at the DNA level. Our methods are indirect. They're very powerful. They're very highly accurate, but they're not as visual as you might like. We do have methods, though, now that allow you to read out uh, with high accuracy all three billion of the letters of the DNA instruction book. Those letters are actually these chemical bases. The chemical language of DNA is a simple one. There's only four letters in the alphabet, those bases that we abbrevi abbreviate A, C, G, and T. And we have methods uh, of being able to compare then the DNA sequence of people who have a disease versus people who don't and look for the critical differences in order to nail down something that might be the cause. Well, since, however, we all differ in our DNA sequence by about a half of 1%, you wouldn't get very far if you basically sequenced my DNA and the DNA of somebody with Parkinson's disease trying to figure out what the differences were because there would be way too many of them. But if you're willing to do that for a large number of people, you kind of average out all the noise and the difference that matters begins to be more and more clear. That's an overly simplified description of how a geneticist goes about zeroing in on the actual molecular cause of a complex or a simple disease. This worked most readily for diseases that are highly heritable, cystic fibrosis, Huntington's disease. Uh, those are conditions where a single mutation very reproducibly results in the disease. It's been a lot tougher for diseases where the inheritance is muddy. Uh, if you take diabetes, for instance, which is what my lab primarily works on, or you take asthma or high blood pressure, that is not a set of conditions where one gene is involved in risk. There are dozens of genes involved in that, and no single one of them contributes very much, but you put it all together, and the consequence to that individual may tip them over the threshold uh, into having the illness. We're in the throes right now trying to sort that part out uh, for the common diseases that we know have hereditary influences because they run in families, but they're much more complicated than, say, cystic fibrosis. There were a lot of surprises, uh, a lot of times where you just marveled at what you had uncovered and felt like uh, you must have really somehow missed it when you were making guesses about what would be there. I guess the one that startled most of us the most profoundly was how few protein coding genes there actually are in the genome. The old paradigm about DNA makes RNA makes protein, well, then a stretch of DNA is going to make a protein. How many genes does it take to specify a human being? Whew, you would think it would be an exorbitant number. And various estimates had been put forward before we knew the answer that we're in the neighborhood of 100 or 150,000. Uh, ultimately, it turns out we only have about 20,000 protein coding genes, uh, a breathtakingly short list of instructions for an organism as complex as Homo sapiens. There are other uh, genes that don't code for protein uh, that are turning out to be pretty important. So in a certain way, we're rescuing our sense of complexity by discovering there are other categories of genes that don't have to be of the protein coding sort. But it is still astounding uh, to think that just 20,000 of these protein coding genes is enough to take a single cell, which we all once were, and inspire this program of elaborate complex development into a human being, including a nervous system, which is beyond our ability at the present time to even quite contemplate because of its complexity. Mm -hmm.